talk organized for next week. So I'm going to take lessons from you. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. And you should probably, well, in a moment, you probably mute your microphone as well. Uh, until we get going. Yeah. The other thing I should do is close everything on my screen that I don't need up there, right? I haven't actually done a Zoom presentation in a while just because, you know, we haven't had to. It's kind of nice. I find the team's presentations up really easy. Yeah. Deborah, if you can mute. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the uh, V2V webinar, thematic webinar. My name is Derek Armitage. I'm at the University of Waterloo and also representing the V2V Global Partnership today. Uh, just before I introduce our guest speaker, I would like to just uh, provide a few additional introductions uh, about our project and, and the thematic webinar itself. So the V2V Global Partnership is a research, knowledge, and action network with over 100 members from Africa, Asia, Canada, and internationally. Uh, and the goal of the partnership uh, is to support small-scale fisheries in their in their transition from vulnerability to viability. Now, we focus on four main aspects in terms of supporting small-scale fisheries. The first is to co-create and co-produce knowledge about small-scale fisheries and the situation around the world, to develop an information system and repository of knowledge to support small-scale fisheries, to develop capacity, transitory capacity in support of small-scale fisheries, and also to synthesize and integrate co-produced knowledge for policy and governance of small-scale fisheries. We are conducting community-engaged research in six countries in Asia, Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, and Thailand, and six countries in Africa, Ghana, Malawi, Nigeria, Senegal, South Africa, and Tanzania. And in doing so, the V2V Global Partnership brings people and organizations together across physical, cultural, and discipline boundaries through a shared interest in addressing the global change impacts on small-scale fisheries. Now, the V2V thematic webinar series is one initiative of the Global Partnership, uh, and its aim is to facilitate and generate some high-level discussions on vulnerability and viability themes and topics within the context of small-scale fisheries more generally, 
Uh, our goal is to feature academics, representatives of governments and intergovernmental organizations, practitioners, members of civil society, uh, who have all made significant contributions to the theory, practice, and policy aspects of small-scale fisheries, both globally and locally. Uh, the thematic webinar series takes place on the last Friday of every month, uh, and will continue to do so during the 2023 and into 2024. The series is available internationally through live streaming on YouTube, uh, and details regarding the monthly webinars, including speakers, topics, and titles, and links to webinar platforms is available on the V2V webpage, www.v2vglobalpartnership.org. Now, today's webinar is the 10th in the series of, of thematic webinars uh, for 2023 and the 34th webinar since January of 2021 when it started. And it's really my privilege today to introduce uh, Trevor Swerdfager as our distinguished speaker. Uh, Trevor really holds a unique role in the Faculty of Environment at the University of Waterloo, a place where he started his academic career, and he's currently a practitioner in residence, which provides uh, an opportunity for those of us in the faculty to interact with someone who's had extensive experience in the public service. In fact, Trevor joined uh, the Faculty of Environment after a 30-year career in Canada's federal public service in many roles of increasing impact and significance. Notably, he was the Director General of the Canadian Wildlife Service, uh, and subsequent to that, he had roles as Director General of Aquaculture in Canada's Department of Fisheries and Oceans, uh, and subsequent to that, he's been the Assistant, assistant Deputy Minister, uh, has had Assistant Deputy Minister roles, uh, and is responsible for a range of issues of relevance to the V2V Global Partnership. Uh, including, but not limited to, a host of, of uh, responsibilities related to fisheries management, to species at risk, to marine protected areas, and so on. He's also served as Senior VP Operations for Parks Canada, um, and, and you have a sense from that, the full range of complex policy dimensions and files that are very relevant to many of the issues and challenges confronting small-scale fisheries around the world. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Trevor uh, Return to the faculty environment where he is now teaching courses on ocean sustainability, environmental policy and decision making, and contributing in many ways to student projects. Uh, and he's also assisting the faculty with the development of educational partnerships and government relations. So it's a real pleasure to have Trevor joining us today uh, and looking very much forward to the conversation. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Trevor, to uh, maybe share your screen and, and feel free to get started. Great, thanks very much, Derek. Uh, this is really a, a pleasure for me to join everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity to have a chat with you. It's always funny, I find, and I'm sure everybody's had this experience to be introduced. I, I kind of listened to my my career history and, and one thing I guess you can take away from it is I, I just can't hold a job. Uh, I just seem to move from thing to thing to thing. Um, today, what I'd like to do is spend a bit of time talking about, based on the experience I've had in the fisheries world, how we go about more effectively connecting data to fisheries decision making and policy and really uh, to give you a few observations just from the the perspective of someone who's been in the field for for quite a while um, how things work the launching point for me with respect to to fisheries management uh, is perhaps a statement of the obvious i i appreciate that but i think sometimes at least in my experience anyway people think about fisheries management is being actively engaged with fish per se and doing a whole variety of things that are much more interactive with the, the natural environment. Really, I think fisheries management is all about decision making. Uh, in most countries, I, I think it's all countries, but uh, just to be sort of potentially a little bit cautious, most countries, to the extent that you can own wild fish at all, and there's obviously a bit of a philosophical debate to be had around that, they're typically owned by a national government, occasionally by a subnational government. In Canada, for example, provinces uh, which are subnational government own some fish freshwater resources, but generally speaking, they're owned by uh, by the government. In, in the Canadian context, we refer to them as they're owned by the crown, uh, because we still have a holdover of that system, uh, for better or for worse. Um, but the point here is that they're owned by government, and private ownership of wild fish is rare. I think it's it doesn't exist, but at least uh, in general terms, you, you can characterize it as. That's quite rare. And so what happens is the governments, in essence, decide uh, whether or not to allow private operators to access fish. Uh, and if they do decide to allow that access, under what conditions? Uh, 
what time, what place, what volume, what methods, uh, what fees are associated with it, um, the seasonality, the nature of the people involved. There's a whole series of things, obviously, that government uh, decides in terms of how access to the, to the resource that is held on behalf of the society is allowed. And so to me, really, the fisheries management debate and discussion and, and activity is a balancing between the benefits that accrue to individual harvesters and harvester organizations in some cases, and balancing that against the long-term uh, resource viability. It's this constant slider scale, if you will, of balancing interests. And fundamentally, it's all about a series of decisions. So it's really a, a decision-making process. There's quite a wide range of factors involved in, in what I consider anyway, not very simple decisions. Uh, I know from talking to people outside my professional community when I was in fisheries and oceans, I would regularly have people say to me, you know, how hard can it be? You count the fish, you figure how much is available, you divvy them all out and call it a day. What do you do all day you know, after you finish that? I think we all know if you're in the fisheries business that the decisions to generate these sorts of activities that are displayed in the images there are really not that simple. Fisheries biology and stock status and all of those sorts of things are obviously central to the decision-making process. So there's this sort of science and, and biology-based core. Occasionally, far too infrequently, unfortunately, but occasionally it's not just about the fishery and the fish species itself, but this broader set of ecosystem concerns as well is sometimes mixed in and, and, and part of the fisheries management decision-making process. But I know certainly from the point of view of people who are in the fish management side of the house, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, a big part of fisheries management is all about economic rates of return uh, and viability, economic viability for harvesters. Uh, that's a major factor. So that if you look at a big piece of gear like this, a couple million dollars worth of equipment running around the place and so on, you want to make sure as part of the fisheries management function that it is economically viable because people make a living from this. People uh, derive their, their well-being and communities are heavily dependent on this uh, activity. And so part of the decision then also inevitably becomes around community dynamics. Uh, what sort of community structures do we want to have? In the Canadian context, in a country that is so large and so active in fisheries, we have an awful lot of debate and discussion around interregional equity. Should you have more of the fishery available to people in Prince Edward Island versus New Brunswick? Nova Scotia versus Newfoundland, that kind of stuff. There's quite a debate to be had in the decision-making process around large-scale versus smaller scale, the inshore fleet, the out offshore fleet. Um, and so we, we end up with quite a bit of what I would describe as sort of equity type considerations in there. The fishing industry obviously doesn't occur only in the context of actually harvesting the fish. There's quite a bit of uh, processing associated with it. And so onshore employment concerns become a big part of the fisheries management mix as well. In some countries, including, of course, Canada, uh, there are a set of rights that are legally entrenched in, in the Canadian context or constitutionally protected for Indigenous people to have certain levels and types of resource <clears throat> of access to the resource. Uh, and these aren't sort of bolted on after the process uh, where you do all your core decision making work and then say, oh, now we're going to do these other interests. It's not that way. Uh, these rights are actually quite central and part of the mix. And then the final thing that I always sort of highlight for people when I'm thinking about how decisions are made in the fisheries management context is that when you look into a government agency, like the one that I used to be part of leading, uh, it's sometimes tendency to tend to tempting to just view it as a series of org chart boxes, you know, the minister, the deputy minister, the assistant deputy minister, whatever it is. Um, these are people. And I'm aware that that's a statement of the obvious, but it's one that I find is often forgotten. Uh, and so the personal and the political interests of decision makers factor into this mix as well. So you've got quite a complex basket of factors, arrangements, pressures, and so on that are involved in these fisheries management decisions. The point being here, it's not just simply a matter of saying, count how many fish there are, divvy up the available things, and, and move on. So my goal today is to situate um, where data and evidence fit in this context. This little graphic here that uh, DFO, uh, Department of Fisheries Notions, has put in place that I actually wrote quite a long time ago when I worked there, 
uh, talks about moving from data collection, stock assessment, science advice, and so on into management. And really what I want to do is, is trace that through. Some people, as I mentioned before, uh, I think particularly those outside the business, if you will, argue that fisheries management really should just simply follow the science. That what we should do is treat this as a fundamentally science and evidence-based activity. And that those other factors that I mentioned in the previous slide really shouldn't uh, be a big factor. That instead, we should just follow the science alone. But fishing is an industry. It's not just a, a science-based kind of thing. And in Canada, at least, and I think in most parts of the world, it's elected officials, not scientists, uh, that are the decision makers. The people that affect people's lives and affect the allocation of resources and affect how taxpayer dollars are spent are people that are elected and held accountable to do so. Um, our system is set up so that even though scientists obviously inform and feed and, and contribute to the process, the decision maker is an elected official. And so what to me is interesting to sort of puzzle on and think about a little bit in this context is how does evidence, scientific evidence, factor into these decisions? And conversely, how do policymakers themselves and decision makers affect the evidence production process? So the goal for me today is to kind of look at this in both directions. I want to start by tracing how data emerges from the sea, so to speak, that, that collection stage here in, in part one, uh, but also then to sort of turn the telescope around a little bit and think about how policymakers influence evidence production itself. Uh, so it's a, a two-way flow of influence, if you will. And then I want to wrap up with a few observations of what I think this means for fishery sustainability and, and overall viability over the long term. Oh, there's a scary picture, right? And uh, I just want to, before I too much further into it, just comment on, on my positionality so that people understand where I'm coming from on these things. Um, I'm 60 years old, well, I'm, I'm even older than Derek Armitage. Um, I'm a white cisgender male. I'm a father and a grandfather, I'm a brother and an uncle and a bunch of other good things too. I'm born and raised in Ottawa. And I mentioned that because I grew up in international capital. And as I was growing up, I didn't fully understand what difference it makes to where you live. And yet we all grow up with certain biases and perspectives. I grew up in Ottawa and have a, a sense that government's actually a good thing. Uh, based on that. I've worked in Ontario where uh, actually I'm, I'm working again now, of course, and I've lived and worked in Atlantic Canada down in New Brunswick. I've lived in the prairies up in Alberta. Uh, I spent some time in Pacific Canada and then as part of my university training, I spent a year in Australia and uh, just under a year in France. Uh, so I've got that sort of geographic dispersion. Uh, as Derek mentioned, I'm a practitioner in residence in uh, University of Waterloo, which is a perhaps polite term for prof with no PhD, um, based on the experience I bring to the table is, is sort of the logic of this. And I teach courses in oceans and biodiversity conservation. But prior to that, for just over, just under 11 years, I was in the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and the list of program areas that I led there uh, is, is fairly significant. I basically was involved in, in all sides of the house at DFO Typically, people will come up in the science stream or the fish management stream. There aren't too many people that go back and forth in the way that I did, you know, which is really quite a privilege. But it means for the purposes of what you're about to hear over the next uh, few minutes, uh, keep in mind, I'm a, you know, until fairly recently, I'm a lifelong bureaucrat. Uh, and so I may look and sound like the government guy. I don't know. I'll leave that for you to decide. But it certainly is very much sort of the background I bring to bear. And the views that I've got to share with you today are based on that experience, uh, more than any kind of familiarity with the literature and the academic discourse in these areas. You will note, as I move through, you won't hear references to what the literature says and so on, because for the most part, I actually don't know. Uh, I'm learning. I'm, I'm reading more regularly now than I did in the past, but I don't have a lot of familiarity with sort of what I've described as the academic side of this conversation. Most of the views I'll share with you are just based on having worked in this field for a little while and, and whatever it's been able to, to take away from me. Just before I get going in terms of the, the structure and in terms of observations around this, I just want to uh, sort of parenthetically talk about the decision-making system so you get a bit of a sense for where things fit and what I follow. Uh, in the Canadian system, <clears throat> the Minister of the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in this case is a member of parliament, so they're an elected official and a cabinet member. Uh, this distinguishes their differences quite substantially, for example, for those that are familiar with the American system, where 
members of cabinet are not elected. They're appointed by the president. Um, they're not part of the legislature. Here they are. Um, the deputy minister is the head of the department, say in the case of fisheries and oceans, they're career public servants. They're people like me, only smarter. Uh, and they are non-political, non-partisan. They don't change every time the government changes. They're a professional public service and are there as career uh, bureaucrats. And as I say, they're not appointed in. The hierarchy that sits below there is, is, is listed there for you. I'm not going to read it all to you other than to say there's a, a, a cascading set of responsibilities up or down, depending the way you look at it. Um, most of my time in fisheries and oceans was spent at this level here. I was an assistant deputy minister for a while, and then the science job I held was called a senior assistant deputy minister. Um, because Canada is such a large country, we break the organization into regional structures, and so we've got five regions across the country, uh, led each by a regional director general, and then on down the system. I put scientists at the bottom, not because that's where they sit and kind of the importance within the department, but in an organizational structure point of view, they're at sort of the base, if you will, and that becomes important as we'll see in a few minutes. So just a bit of a nomenclature, so to speak, for people as I go through uh, what follows in the next few slides. So I think if you start from the sea or the water surface on the way up um, in the Canadian context, and I think more generally, uh, stock data are collected almost entirely by government personnel. So with scientists who actually design our survey protocols, the timing, the location, all that kind of stuff, it's a science-driven design process. And the actual work is carried out by individuals who work for, uh, for the most part, for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. So when you look at anadromous fish, like we have most commonly, of course, in British Columbia, these guys are hauling a counting fence uh, around because their picture's being taken, they wear all their safety gear and so on. I'm sure that sometimes they're not quite as focused on that. But we count in stream. Uh, so we measure fish that are coming in on return from the sea and then the outgoing flow and so on. Most of the stock surveys though are operated, operated off platforms like this. These pair of icebreakers actually moving along uh, don't do as much scientific work as some others, but there is quite a bit of work still nonetheless done off those platforms. Um, when we harvest fish, for the purposes of carrying out stock uh, data uh, assessments and stock surveys, the harvested fish are destroyed. Uh, they're not sold, uh, which in some people's minds is a bit of a problem, but basically all of the fish that we harvest for scientific purposes are destroyed. Occasionally, probably maybe 15 or 20% of the cases, uh, the government will contract private operators to actually do the fishing itself. And in those instances, um, the fish that are harvested are sold to cover the operating costs. This has been a point of real controversy in terms of data generation and so on. Should you be using the revenues from fish to fund the science operations related to those fish themselves? And there's maybe a bit of an ethical debate to be had in there. The bottom line, regardless of how the data are collected uh, or the final bit here in this coastal context, uh, they're considered government property. And so I should have maybe actually literally underlined this because it very much is a mindset that most people in government consider these our data. Uh, and there's a possessiveness about it that is quite pronounced in most parts of the federal system, at least, and I think more generally. The use of citizen science uh, or indigenous knowledge or industry generated data in this data collection process in our fisheries management system, at least, is rare. Uh, it's not zero, but it's awfully darn close. Things are changing a little bit for sure, but the traditional management focus and the data collection activity, <clears throat> citizen science, and for lack of a better term, non-government science is not extensive in the process. Data are assembled <clears throat> from individual data points or datum into evidence by DFO science staff. It's technical staff at the department here who carry out all of the quality assurance and, and quality control work. Uh, and so this is a completely internal sort of thing. It's Department of Fisheries and Oceans scientists who design and run models that are based on that data. The people that are involved in actual management activities in terms of setting allocations and so on, which we'll talk about in a, in a second, are not involved at all in model design and modeling structures and so on. So we're still very much in a, a hived off sort of process. People in the fisheries management branch, which organizationally is, is separate from science, are not involved in this process at all. 
Um, and I highlight this and I make a point of it because um, in the public discourse in Canada right now, there's a fair bit of attention being focused on the link between management and science. And there's an argument that is in some quarters made that fish management people and, and fisheries are skewing or interfering with or cooking the books on the data and so on in here. In my experience, at least, that is simply not the case. The folks that are involved in generating the, the evidence in this sort of side of things are not people who are making the fish management decisions. So the fisheries management branches say are, are not involved in this. Thing. External input into the evidence production is basically zero. And so this, of course, if you're outside the system is, is problematic. Your ability to kind of enter into and understand how assembly of evidence and so on occurs is quite limited. Uh, it's it's in formal sense, it's it's not much at all. The modeling work that's done to drive and to generate all of this evidence draws on best uh, available literature and so on, but it's highly idiosyncratic. Uh, just about every scientist that I work with, she or he would develop their own models, they'd run their own data and so on. There's no standardized approach across the system uh, in DFO and in more general terms. And so you've got models that differ quite a bit from fisheries to fisheries. The bottom line, from my point of view, in terms of taking an individual data point or datum uh, from the sea and transforming it into evidence, is it's a very internal process. Uh, external engagement in it, in it is actually quite low. The survey data, of course, drives stock assessments that probably you're all familiar with. The assessments estimate harvest rates that will not impact stock health. Um, and these preliminary assessment reports, again, are generated entirely internally uh, by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and by DFO staff, particularly and primarily rather over on the science side of things. Harvesters and academics, <clears throat> environmental groups, indigenous organizations and so on are then invited to appear and engage rather in peer review workshops. In the context of the, the fisheries model over time, this is still a relatively new process for a long time until about a decade ago or so, <clears throat> uh, DFO would do its assessments and just simply publish it. Uh, peer review was entirely internal uh, and the external involvement in it was very, very low. When the cod fishery collapsed in, in Newfoundland in the late 80s and early 90s and the moratorium was put in place, the department realized that its uh, science process simply wasn't good enough. And it opened the process quite substantially there's debate and argument to be had about whether they did so efficiently or su sufficiently rather. Uh, but we now have a peer review process that's quite rigorous uh, and quite routine for basically every commercially fished stock. These workshops that are held around peer review are generally very much science debates uh, and back and forth and so on, as opposed to positional representations. Uh, the ones that I've been to, you know, often if you were sitting there as a sort of a fly on the wall, so to speak, watching how the conversation unfolds, it's often difficult to tell who works for which group. Uh, everybody's just coming at the data in their own particular way as opposed to defending a positional uh, kind of approach on anything. For sure, everybody brings a bias and a perspective uh, to the table, but for the most part, it's a, a pretty healthy scientific uh, situation or, or debate rather. It yields a final assessment report that becomes uh, a public record document. It's published on what we call the Canadian Science Advisory Secretariat, CSAS uh, site. And so these assessment reports are published uh, publicly and available for everybody to see. Importantly, from the point of view of decision making and how the chain works, I would underscore the point that the assessments are approved only by the regional director for science in whatever region they're generated and by the assistant deputy minister for science who for four and a half years was me. Uh, the people that are involved in the management side of the house uh, or the political part of the, the organization have no involvement in that approval chain whatsoever. And so again, I underscore the, it's not, it's slightly exaggerating to say the you know, full sanctity of science, so to speak, but these assessments are produced very much in a science chain. They are not really amenable to influence from the people on the management side of the house. It's not a debate in that respect. And so the science uh, that goes into the assessment is very much owned, if you will, by the science sector of the, of the department. The stock assessments, of course, trigger the fisheries management uh, organization's machinery. So now we sort of Figuratively speaking, you take the science and, and throw it over the transom, so to speak, uh, over to the fish management folks, whose goal 
for the most part, is to maximize economic return for harvesters. Uh, essentially, that's the, the name of the game from the point of view of fisheries managers. There will be those who would say, no, that's an unduly uh, economically oriented characterization of it. And that what we're interested in in fisheries management is the broader ecosystem concern, the long-term history of the resource and that kind of stuff. I was the head of fisheries management for a while. Uh, I can tell you from my experience, at least, that's not so. The fundamentally what we wanted to do was to figure out harvest levels that would guarantee the highest economic return to the harvester possible while still safeguarding, of course, the long-term viability of the resource. In fisheries management, when I was in that part of the department, we consider stock assessments as advice, so I put it in bold. It's not direction. It's not something that we felt that was uh, given to us that we had better have to take as given and react. Instead, it's advice regarding the risks associated with different harvest levels. If we allow a harvest of X, what might happen to the stock? If we allow a harvest of Y, what might happen to the stock and so on? And every science assessment report, of course, comes with these confidence intervals in terms of the estimate. And so we would look at how you play, if you will, in there and so on. And so the business of setting a total allowable catch uh, requires balancing the risk to the resource from putting in place too aggressive a harvest level or too high a harvest level. And at the same time, risk to the industry from going the other way with too conservative a harvest level. If you have the harvest levels that are so low, the industry can't survive, then uh, there's really no point to fisheries management. So it's essentially this risk management uh, approach, which is the essence, I think, anyway, of fisheries management decision making. I, I've put this in sort of somewhat polite terms, the dynamic tension uh, in the debate between science and fisheries units is often very, very robust. It's very professional, but there are often quite heated arguments between science staff and fisheries management about what, in fact, is a, a, a sustainable or a viable total allowable catch. But once the, that that tack is set, we know that the total allowable harvest is whatever it is. Now, the business of allocating that out to individual harvesters is entirely a policy matter. It's no longer a science question. The fisheries management machine and engine takes over, and it's that part of the organization that actually starts to allocate harvest down to an individual license holder or to the offshore case, the fleet case down to a particular company. The essence of the, the game, if, if you will, is captured by this single chart. This is this is sort of probably if you were to, to go on a little tour of Department of Fisheries and Oceans and, and kind of monitored in some weird survey, the frequency of posters you see in the wall, this would be number one. This is right at the core of how DFO's thinking works insofar as allocation is concerned. It's the essence of what they refer to as the precautionary approach. And so if you look at the status of fish stock, uh, zero is obviously never really the case, but in theory anyway, uh, a high abundance. We think of fisheries in three main zones. Uh, if you have a harvest rate that is never going to be zero because there's bycatch, but if you imagine a harvest rate from roughly or near zero to a higher level, what we're obviously ultimately looking for is stuff that's in the healthy zone. Now figure out what that maximum acceptable harvest is, where you hit the sweet spot between uh, status of the fish and the harvest rate. And our goal is to make sure that harvesting always remains in this healthy zone. When we get into this upper stock reference point, uh, here's where the some degree you almost have to read this chart from right to left instead of left to right. But as abundance starts to decline, we have to start thinking of lower harvest rates. We get into this cautious zone. And the delineation point between cautious and, and healthy is what we refer to as the upper stock reference point. And so here, when this abundance is starting to get down into this range, what we're supposed to see anyway is reduction in harvest to a point that hopefully you don't get to. Uh, very often, but the limit reference point below which you're in what's called the critical zone. And according to DFO policy published on their website, it's not implied or suggested anywhere. Once you're in this critical zone, harvest should go to zero. Um, and so the whole idea with this precautionary approach is to keep as many of the species as possible, and ideally all of them, in this healthy zone. And so the whole debate and dynamic around assigning a tack and then subsequently allocating it out turns around which zone we're in. What should happen is that all of our commercial fisheries should be in the healthy zone. And if they're in the critical, the harvest should be zero. 
point of fact, unfortunately, that is not the case, as I'll come to in a second. The decision-making vehicle for figuring out where in this kind of thing you end up is what we call a memo, a memorandum to minister. What the picture of the minister, Madame uh, Boutillier, who is the current minister of fisheries and oceans. Um, she's from Les Îles de Madeleine, which is a series of islands just to the north of uh, Prince Edward Island, for those of you who are not familiar with that area. So she comes from a fishing community. She has a deep, deep set of ties to the fishing community in not only her region, but more generally. Uh, she's a Francophone minister and has got a very close tie to the Francophone component of the industry. She understands fish in a very visceral and personal sort of way. And it's her that is making the decisions on these things. The memo to minister is signed off by a deputy minister. So remember back on our chain, which is why I recognize that, so the top bureaucrat, but has to be signed <clears throat> by the ADM of science or the ADM of fishery management, both of which I was at different times, and each level below. So you've got quite this hierarchical approach as you move up from this thing. What it does is it forces the science and the fish management units to, to come together. The bottom line, though, at the end of the day is if you kind of think of push comes to shove, who has the final say in what the recommendation is? It's the people in fisheries management. It's not the science people. Uh, and you can argue whether that's good or bad, but if you go back into that slide a few ago where I talked about the various factors involved in the decision, that broader mix of things comes into it on the fish management side. It's not just about the science. That memorandum that the minister receives summarizes the views and interests and perspectives around this. It summarizes the science and all that kind of stuff. And then it recommends to the minister a particular allocation. In our context, in Section 7 of the Fisheries Act, the minister uh, is given, quote, from the act, absolute discretion. She can accept, reject, or modify that and has to justify that decision to exactly no one. Um, it's a it's a, a very unusual factor in Canadian law. You just don't see that level of ministerial power, but that's how our system is set up. And for those that are interested in the process and understanding how these memos get written and wanted to examine them, you can't. Uh, they're all classified as secret. Um, every now and then one gets leaked, uh, but they're never released publicly. Uh, there's some provision, I think after 50 years or something like that, they're allowed to be released. But generally speaking, the, the process is an extremely secretive one. The memo is in writing, obviously, and it is actually literally signed by the minister, but it's not something that ever gets released. And so it's a very internal black box sort of process in many respects. The involvement in a formal sense from industry, civil society, indigenous people, and so on, to the memo to minister is zero. For sure, there's informal lobbying on occasion, but essentially this is a very internal to government process. Ministers and their political staff are really active participants in the process at the, the end of it. There are some observers who, court, who, of course, really lament this notion of political interference. Uh, so people who are here in Parliament and so on are, in some people's eyes at least, uh, interfering in the decision. But the reality is, as I mentioned before, decision-making is explicitly, it's not implied or suggested or, or intuited in any way, it's explicitly assigned to the minister in the Fisheries Act. So political folks cannot quote, interfere in what is really their process. It is a political process. It's designed that way by law. You can debate whether it's a good thing or not, but it's a thing. Uh, and so the idea of political involvement in, in the process is written right into the groundwork framework of the process, a point I'll return to in the concluding slides. So ministers and their political staff very rarely care a lot about the, the science. They'll start going, yeah, yeah whatever. Uh, they're very much around how much resource can we get in and how much can we allocate to our constituents, to our clientele. Political decisions as a result that contradict science advice, unfortunately, from my biased perspective, are not rare. There's a list of species that are decisions have been made on even just in the last three years where the science said attack Max should be this, and minister said, thanks very much, we're going to do this. Not always, but often, it's not just a matter of overriding the science advice. Ministers will fairly often also override the advice from their fisheries management staff themselves. It's not unheard of for the recommendation to the minister to be at a particular level and the minister picks a higher one. Uh, that's not frequent, but it's not rare either. And so you've got this system in which the political engagement potential is very significant. 
So point in all this is it's a bit of a labyrinth trail from a single data point to a ministerial discussion or decision. We've got all of these steps uh, in here, as I, I note in this first bullet. Um, and the external influence points in a formal sense are really limited to that stock assessment peer review. For sure, there's an informal lobbying around the process and so on over time, but the ability to actually directly participate in these various steps that we described in bullet one there is actually quite low. Ministerial decisions balance all those factors I talked about a few slides ago, including the evidence base, but they're in this very black box internal to government kind of format. And the bottom line is that the, for me, the data to evidence the decision chain is along a very multi-layered one that is not just a matter of quote, follow the science, but in fact, is quite a wide range of factors that I think it's important to understand as we look at this process. Turning the telescope just the other way around a little bit to segue into that part of the discussion, it's at the same time true that, that, that there's a ripple effect to what decision makers and policy makers in Ottawa and the, in the federal context put in place and how data are collected. Senior management uh, in what I describe operations is really actually quite low. You don't get political folks sort of saying, here's how I want you to collect your data and all that kind of stuff. That really doesn't happen in any kind of direct operational sense. But for sure, senior level policy and financial decisions have a huge impact of whether or not evidence even gets collected in the first place, what the priorities are and so on. And in my experience, at least, the operational effects of those decisions are quite indirect and often unseen and, and underappreciated. Uh, we have decisions that are taken by the policymakers in Ottawa that have enormous downstream impacts. And as I say, I think those are very rarely even fully understood and seen, let alone discussed. So the reshaping of data collection and evidence production process, really, the point here is that you're going to have to, we're going to have to reshape the policy environment for that to happen. Political interest in data collection, typically pretty close to zero. The citizens makers here in the House of Commons, which in this picture obviously is empty, um, they're mostly focused on the present, not the long-term future. Data and evidence, they sort of see that as the technical point of view. And in Canada, as a result, where the real decisions that affect how data are collected, stored, managed, and so on, it occurs at that ADM level that I talked about before. That's the vital choke point or influence point in terms of the structure and the priorities and so on and social development. Political involvement in that is, is minimal. And so people who spend time lobbying ministers around data and data structure and policy, and people do this regularly, from my point of view, they're completely wasting their time. Ministers are just not interested in that. The ADM cadre, the deputy cadre, and so on, they respond hugely to what legislative and regulatory directions say. I think there's a tendency on occasion to think that bureaucrats are just sort of run amok, they do whatever they want. That's not true, at least not in my experience anyway. Uh, they're very much associated with and tied to what the law says. And if the law doesn't say much of anything, they will respond to what they think the politicians and other demands are and so on, or their own particular views. But the starting point is law. The funding decisions that they make and the program decisions really have a huge impact on what data gets collected. Scientists can state the obvious, they only deliver and design, design and deliver data collection programs they have funding for. And so decision makers allocate funds to their priorities. Uh, they are not accidental or automatic. It's not just a matter of saying, you know, we just churn away on this all the time. So when we look at citizen science or traditional knowledge or community-based information or these things and say, well, you know, it's just sort of an oversight that they're not involved. That's not true. There's a conscious decision to not involve those sorts of data collection activities in the decision-making process. It's not an oversight. It's not a by the by. It's a decision that instead we're going to focus on other things. And those decisions are made by policymakers in Ottawa, not for the most part by operational folks. The decision to fund species-based data collection, as opposed to ecosystem-oriented things, is a decision. It's a choice. There are choices to be made, and the, the system continuously chooses the species-based approach. The critical uh, choke point in all of this, from the point of view of anybody who's in the data management business, is ship time. Because most of our stock survey work is carried out from ships, uh, the single biggest expense around that right now is the ship time itself. So. A harvest survey vessel, for example, uh, my budget when I was running it, typically if you were running a ship survey, ship-based survey, 
the operating costs for anything that is uh, significant are about $80,000 a day. And so you imagine the stock survey that is 10, 20, however many days, you can go through millions of dollars very quickly uh, before you even blink an eye. I, in the budget I was managing, I was responsible in the science world for a budget that was approximately half a billion dollars. Uh, almost uh, 80 million of that would go right into shipping costs to give it a sense of context. So how the government decides and decision makers decide to allocate money into this thing really, really quite critical. So what's this all mean for, um, sorry, for date and the evidence and fisheries management? When you look at it from the point of view of a community like this, Nova Scotia, I think a key thing for a start is that we need to understand the full decision-making chain as opposed to just the science. Anybody who says, well, you know, fisheries management should be all follow the science from my vantage point based on what I used to do anyway, I think that's just naive. It's an incomplete understanding of the picture. It's not just about the science, although that is obviously it's for. Traditional fisheries management, at least in Canada, and I think in my interactions with my colleagues in similar jobs around the world, it's designed not to be transparent. This is not an accident. It's not sort of a little oversight. It's not a matter of saying, oh, yeah, we should have shared those. It's a specific design feature. And so if we're going to see transparency, which I think is at the heart of an awful lot of more community-based decision-making and so on, that requires fundamental system level change. It's not a tweak because the system is explicitly designed not to have that. Similarly, uh, it's designed in such a way that engaging local or community knowledge and fisheries management <clears throat> activities, the system is designed not to do that. And so simply tacking it on to existing systems, in my view at least, is not going to work. Uh, we need different systems as opposed to modifications or tweaks or bolt-ons or afterthoughts into the system. And I, I just can't see that happening with quote, the core traditional paradigm. It's not true, at least in my view anyway, to say that the evidence base for fisheries is commonly ignored and so on. Most fisheries management uh, decisions are heavily evidence-based, at least in Canada, but only for certain species of interest, i.e. the commercially harvested ones, and with very limited external access to this process. Uh, and so, as I said before, it's, up, it's not a transparent process. Evidence is a big deal, but it's very difficult for the public to know that and to prove that. Where we go with all this, from my point of view, is the starting point is that laws matter hugely. Laws codify what society values with respect to fisheries. And in Canada, we've said, here's what we value. This is the purpose statement in Section 2 of the Fisheries Act. Look what it doesn't say. It does not talk about biodiversity or social inclusion or equitable benefits or anything like knowledge co-production, any of those sorts of things. It doesn't talk about transparency. It doesn't talk about evidence, all those sorts of things. That's not part of what it's codified as a value statement, which unsurprising, my view, is, is quite a problem. So the law sets this out. Laws drive most government program design. As a senior bureaucrat, when you go across the the, the, the transom, so to speak, and start to talk to people in the Department of Finance on the adjunct budgetary process, they will sit there and say to you, where does it say in the law you have to do these things? And if you say something to them along the lines, well, it doesn't really say that in the law, but we know it's the right thing to do. You should usually get laughed out of the room. Forget it. And so laws drive program designs and concepts like knowledge co-production, for example, or social inclusion or transparency and so on. If they're not grounded in law, they're very rarely reflected in management paradigm, uh, management programs. There's an almost one-to-one -one linkage. You see what's in the Fisheries Act, what's in the fisheries management paradigms. There's quite a strong link, A, between what's in the Act and what happens, and what's not in the Act doesn't happen. Major funding decisions, as I say, are tied to these legal requirements. And so all of these non-legal things, like data collection for, quote, non-commercial species or ecosystems and so on, for the most part, the system reacts by saying, forget about it. It's not required by law. We're not doing it. So from my point of view, when you look at where all this takes us in the fisheries management uh, paradigm, if you will, the bottom line is that if we're going to directly and substantively enhance uh, sustainability at any scale, whether it's in a small scale fishery, like uh, we're talking about in the context of this particular partnership or a much larger one, and if we're going to do things to protect animals like these ones, Driving system level change in the traditional management paradigm is essential. 
I don't buy the idea that you can go in and you can make a few small adjustments in the existing system. You can add in a knowledge co-production module, for example, and bolt that into the system. I just don't think that's going to have to ha is going to happen. We have to drive system level change. I think it's important for everybody who's involved in these sorts of activities and in this policy and, and, and program debate and discussion to be aware of all aspects of the decision-making apparatus, not just the science base. You can like or not like the non-science component of it, but to rail against you know, the non-science factors and so on, I think is just pointless. That is the reality of fisheries management and the nature of the industry. And people need uh, who are, are looking at influencing and understanding us just need to understand that full picture, whether they like all of its elements or not, it's a different story perhaps, but to sort of focus only in on what the biology says and expect the system to re reply accordingly, as I said before, I think is naive and incomplete. I think we need new legal foundations that catalyze and support the changes we see. If we're going to have knowledge co-production as a common feature in fisheries management in Canada, I think uh, we need to change the law to that effect. And I would argue the same is true in any country of the world. Uh, it's extremely unlikely, I would suggest, uh, that we're going to see a whole series of innovative fisheries management approaches and designs put into effect without a legal base for requiring them to do so. I understand and acknowledge that the legal framework and legal systems differ from country to country, and just because it works or doesn't work, depending when you look at it that way in Canada, obviously it doesn't mean you can just pick that up and drop that down into other countries. But from my knowledge and <clears throat> experience of uh, fisheries management in many places in the world, if you have the legal foundation either ill-conceived or incomplete, or in many cases, or in some cases rather, just not there. The likelihood of strong program being built on that and succeeding, I would suggest anyway, is quite low. Uh, so from my point of view, I, I would wrap it all up by saying, I think that really the bottom line here is that as you look across the management paradigm, the role of data and evidence in decision-making is quite substantial. It's in, at least in many cases, it's a very black box internal kind of thing. I think that needs to change over time if we're to improve fishery sustainability. The way to do that is through law reform, among other things, and to build programs based on a strong legal foundation that will take us to a more sustainable future for fisheries uh, more generally. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Bye. Great. Thanks a lot, Trevor. That was excellent. Um, really fascinating overview and insight onto that uh, process of fisheries management and that, as you say, the chain, uh, the flow from data and science and evidence and how that interacts with decision making. So lots of different points of contacts, uh, contacts and intersections there, which are quite interesting to explore. Um, so we have time for, for some questions. And, and I, I know we have a few questions coming in now. And so we'll Please, if you're um, you know following us uh, on YouTube, feel free to to add in a question, and we'll we'll try and get it to Trevor here. Um, so I'm going to start off with a few few questions that are coming in, and I have uh, one or two of my own if we have time, uh, Trevor. So that that's great. Uh, I have one question here from from Denise, uh, uh, and it's about this whole issue of data. and And the question is, uh, if fisheries data are to be entirely collected by government personnel and make it, uh, and so it becomes a government property, does this not lead to a top-down form of fishery management measures? Well, I, I think the answer is, is almost in, uh, undeniably yes. Uh, if you consider government as the top, some people consider it as the bottom, but uh, certainly if, if the, the collection process is entirely the purview of a government agency, government then has two big things going for it. If you Think about it from a bureaucrat's point of view. One is you can control the process. You can control what you harvest, how you harvest, uh, what you collect data on, how you do it, how you store it, and so on. And so you have a high degree of, of control over the process and on what you share. And so you can see the government interest in that, right? If you're sitting there and you want to have a process that's uh, predictable and that you're able to run and so on, Having those data housed internally there's a, and collected internally has a high appeal to it. And so I would say that the reply to the question is, for sure, it entrenches this somewhat top-down kind of thing. And until we have systems in place that feature, as a matter of routine, data collected outside the system, the, the government, that government agency will remain very heavily involved. And the ability of people who are not part of that system to influence the data side of things is low. And uh, until that changes, 
I, I think that's going to continue to be a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and actually, that kind of leads into a, a, another question that was asked here by, by Riel. Um, uh, and so his question is, do you think the method of data collection and specifically, uh, especially by a government, can pen potentially lead to either vulnerability or more vulnerability of small scale fisheries? And if so, how? The, 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 to me, the real strength of uh, in, in most cases, if you have government involved in, in responsible for collection, there's a high likelihood that it will continue over time. And I think that's important. I think if you have a, a fully decentralized data collection system, for example, um, the, it, it, that system is vulnerable to change, to resource fluctuations, to change over in personnel, that kind of stuff, and so on. So having government involved over the long term is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, and I think that the more baseline function that's in place from a government perspective, uh, the better. We also, in most fisheries, have a need to be able to compare situations across the range of a stock. If you've got a, an exclusively decentralized uh, system for data collection, it makes it much more difficult, or at least it can anyway, to compare stock data from position or geographical location A, B, C, D, and E. And so that common and standardized approach across the, the picture, I think, it is good. Um, so there is an awful lot to be said, I would argue anyway, for a strong government-based uh, collection system but I, I do think that what we need to be able to do is to augment that substantially on a community by community basis, because that, I would argue, strengthens community and local resiliency, not weakens it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and I'm just, I'm wondering, just uh, to pick up on that, it's kind of my own uh, observation. So the, the idea, though, is that if you're going to augment that by, with community data, citizen science data, that's going to be very hit and miss. How do you, what is the, what is the limitation of, of sort of that augmentation process? Because I would imagine there are some contexts where, I'm thinking of Canada, but in many jurisdictions, there are some contexts where there is going to be that capacity and some that don't. So is there a risk, though, that you're going to have a very kind of variable access to, to helpful data for these decision-making processes? This is part of the reason I go back to the business of, of changing the law uh, and the law found legal foundation for a lot of this stuff. If the law was rewritten in such a way that would say something like, the minister shall ensure that regional data collection systems are in place sufficient to allow the following things to occur, that would increase the likelihood that mm -hmm. would actually happen. I, I know that just because you pass the law doesn't mean things automatically happen. I get that. But right now, the capacity on a community by community basis or a region by region basis is wildly variable because the government doesn't have to fund it. And no one else does. And so because there's no requirement for capacity to be built in this sort of more decentralized context, it doesn't happen. If we had that in place, I think that, yes, for sure, there are going to be pockets where people will become more or less involved and so on. But I think if we had a stronger policy and legal base in place that would drive and require and expect that to happen, as opposed to hope for it, that would be good. Hope is good, but it's not a strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that if we had something in place that requires this stuff to happen, as opposed to have hope for it, we'd be better off. Okay. Good. Uh, okay, uh, a few more questions have been coming in here. So we have one from uh, Ariola. Uh, could you explore, expand a little bit on the statement, consider all aspects of decision making and not only science based? That's something that you had said. Um, the, the question here is to um, just expand on that because uh, one would consider that the evidence based management as the best form of management. So I think that. Uh... I would agree that in many respects, if you had a system for making decisions that is just evidence-based, you sort of do all of the scientific work required to generate an estimate on TAC and a total allowable catch and then hand it out, you'd be probably in a somewhat idealized system. The reality, of course, is that the system of fishery management involves people. And as soon as people get into the mix, weird things start to happen and interests become involved and so on. Um, and this is not a machine. Mother Nature is not a machine. You can just sort of start it up and, and run it. And so the decision-making process processes uh, inevitably evolve all of these community and social and economic factors in a way that uh, is typical of any other industry. Uh, you know, anywhere in the in certainly in Canada, I think anywhere in the world, 
when you're making decisions that affect people, you want to have this range of factors considered as opposed to simply what the science says. Uh, and so I think that the evidence needs to be the foundation, the core, the center uh, of the decision and decision-making process in fisheries management. But all these other aspects, I think, are significant and important as well. And I, again, go back to this notion that I don't know why this is the case, but often I, I've seen situations where observers tend to forget that it's people that are making these decisions. That's people that are affected by them. It's not machines. We don't just type into chat GPT, what should the total allowable catch for Northern God be? Who knows? Maybe we'll end up doing that one day. But uh, in, until that happens, uh, it's very much a human process with human dynamics. And I think that it's not just a matter of plugging in a bunch of data to the model and spitting out the answer. Okay. So that actually got me thinking a little bit about a, a question I had, and, and we, there's some other questions here we, we can get to in a second, but you do, you, and it's connected to what you were just saying, I think, but you just really highlighted previously the goal of fisheries management and the, the focus on the economic rates of return um, and for, for harvesters. And so when we're thinking about viability of fisheries, it becomes a very much, much economic kind of thing. Uh, and so this is a very V2V oriented question. I'm just wondering, as someone immersed in, in the, these policy processes and the science processes, um, how might we overcome that, uh, I guess, that focus on or the overemphasis of or try and better balance that that uh, emphasis on economic viability with these other dimensions uh, that are important that you kind of mentioned? I'm thinking of different social objectives, the desire to maintain a, 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 a rural coastal community. Um, and have that sense of place and where people are connected to each other. How do we balance that economic viability piece with these many other dimensions of viability that may be just as important, but much, le much less easy to sort of navigate in a decision context? There are a couple of things that occur to me in, in, in the Canadian context. One area where we do exactly what you're describing is in Atlantic Canada, where we have two core fisheries management policies that have got nothing to do with science. Uh, in, in Canada, in Atlantic Canada, not in the Pacific, but if you are a uh, holder of a license, the owner of the license must operate the vessel to which the license applies. So we have what's called the owner-operator policy. And so if Derek Armitage owns a license, Derek Armitage and his crew have to fish that license. You can't go and hire Travis Wertrager and Joe Blow and so on to go do it. You can't hold multiple licenses. And so you can't be sort of a, an administrative overlord, so to speak, with a whole series of fish captains as employees. And so the whole purpose of that is social engineering, if you will, to maintain the individual enterprise. The second thing is what we call fleet separation policy, where if you own a fish processing plant, you cannot own a fish license and vice versa. And so we keep the processing and the harvesting sector separated apart. Why? because we want to maintain capacity for processing in certain places and keep community structures in place. That's the only reason. There's no biological logic to that whatsoever. I've argued in the past, that in fact, it's a perverse thing. It has negative biological impacts. Point here is that you can put in place policies, which you know some people might call social harvest control rules of some kind, that will say we're going to put social, and in this case, community concerns above or, or yeah, above some of the biological priorities, they're going to be starting points. You can do that. And I think there is evidence that that's been done here. And it seems to me that the same concept or approach can be walked out into a, a B2B type context fairly straightforwardly. Mm -hmm. So, and, and there's a lot of regional variation, even in the Canadian context with policies like that, so that they're not across the board, which actually leads to a, a question <laughs> from from Maha, um, a little bit about some of that differentiation. Uh, to The question is, does this management system that you were talking about, um, this federal management system, does it differ in some ways in, in BC versus Newfoundland? Because I have seen, uh, the question is, I've seen some good examples of integrating citizen knowledge during COVID-19 in British Columbia and Newfoundland. So are there variations in how these things pan out? Yes. <laughs> the variations are huge. Uh, and, and one of the things that, uh, as a, a longtime bureaucrat that always used to just, just puzzle me endlessly, it was why when you have one single department with one single information or decision maker, we have such widely divergent approaches across the country. 
Now, part of it is obviously when you're dealing with a country that's six and a half thousand kilometers wide and it's got you know enormous diversity, there's no way you're going to have everything be exactly the same everywhere. The country's too big, the people are too diverse, and so on. And so, uh, this sort of uniformity uh, across the country is, I think, neither feasible nor desirable. But we do have uh, an awful lot of what I would describe as editorializing, usually positively where individuals will say, you know, actually, we're going to work more with the community of X or Y or Z to bring in more local knowledge and data and so on. And it works quite well. That doesn't necessarily get uh, transported and, and put in place across the system. And so to go back to a point, Derek, that you raised a few minutes ago, what I see increasingly is uh, almost unfair, or certainly unequal access to resources based on the capacity that individual communities are able to assemble. Some First Nation communities, for example, relative to others, are quite wealthy uh, and are able to hire fisheries biologists or hire people to interview community members to generate a community view on an allowable harvest or a harvest technique, and some others are not. And so where you see the capacity for this sort of stuff emerge and develop, they not only, but one major follow-on is that they're able to interact with that process in a much more effective way. So you do see quite a bit of variation across the country. And I, I like the idea uh, and I'm supportive of the idea of uh, individual or community-based innovation and drive. I like the idea that it it's over and above a common baseline uh, as opposed to some places just not having anything at all and others doing very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, a few more questions here. And this one actually is from, uh, from Pratip. Uh, Trevor, thank you very much for your thoughtful talk. I wonder if you could speak to the diversity of data required um, beyond the quantitative and qualitative divide. So uh, is there a need to integrate stock assessment data with social data? And if yes, what are some of your thoughts about how to do that? So, uh, yeah, I know this will sound maybe a little bit weird, but if I could kind of separate myself in two for a minute uh, from my two careers, uh, as an academic and as a, someone who gets to hang around with people like you, Derek and Pratip, clearly the answer to the question is yes, we should have more integration of these socioeconomic factors and it shouldn't be just about collecting stock data, et cetera, and generating the thing. We should be thinking about socioeconomic benefits, community driven things and how to measure those and build those in and make a much more rounded picture come alive with respect to the fishery in a particular area or a given stock and so on. I think there's a, a high degree of appeal to that. I think that approach makes an awful lot of sense, not only in Canada, but in other parts of the world uh, where you're trying to take this more holistic approach to understanding and managing the fisheries. Uh, that for me has a high degree of academic allure and appeal and there's a goal to aspire to. If I go and I put my bureaucrat hat back on, I sit there and go, hold my iron and go, what are you crazy? There's no way I'm doing that. Uh, first of all, that's way too much work uh, to go and collect all those data. It's highly variable. It's a giant undertaking to store, house, and uh, think about those more personal oriented data. But the big kicker is to, to repeat my earlier theme is if I'm sitting there as the ADM of fisheries management, as I was for many years, and I've got this gigantic pile of things I have to do. And I've got this pile over here of things I know I should do, but I kind of really don't have the money to do it. I'm going to do the have to do things first. And there's nothing in the law or in even a strong policy, never mind the law, that says I have to do all this kind of stuff. I'm never going to do that. Uh, and so the idea of, of building all of these, for lack of a better term, non-biological data into the system, uh, in the current arrangement, that's a nice idea in my bureaucrat world, I'm never going to do that. Okay. Very honest answer. Um, okay, two two more questions here. One uh, is from uh, from Denise. Uh, what level of uh, community engagement in terms of percentage and decision making do you think can work best in managing managing fishery resources? So I guess the question is: Is there a sweet spot um, for engaging with with communities and in, in, uh, in decision making? I like the idea that fishery allocation decisions are more community-based than uh, not. And by allocation, I mean, once we know the royal we collectively, we know what the harvest that is sustainable from a biological perspective is. Um, I'm much more in favor of the idea of saying, 
communities, whether an individual community or a community of people, the residents of rural Newfoundland or whatever, or a group of First Nations, um, I'm much more comfortable with the idea of them figuring out who actually carries out the harvesting, how that work is done, and how, to go back to the question you just asked, or critiqued it, I guess, how the socioeconomic benefits and so associate rather divide up. Uh, I think that the level of community engagement in that should be high because it's the communities that are affected. They're doing the work, preparing, they should have a, a strong involvement in how that allocation stuff gets done. In, in some cases, particularly for stocks that move around or there are in multiple locations, it just doesn't make sense to me. And I, I don't know if it's because I'm a bureaucrat or biologist or a bit of both or whatever, but if you're trying to understand the stock status of northern cod, for example, or actually a better example is Pacific salmon, where you've got multiple runs coming out, I don't think you can do that on a community by community basis. It just doesn't make sense from a, a biological point of view. And negotiating total allowable harvest for every community down the British Columbia coast, be they a First Nation or a non First Nation community. Boys and boys, I just don't know how you do that from a purely science and logistical point of view. And so arguing that there should be intense and heavy community involvement in every one of those decisions, I think is, is just an impractical sort of thing. So long-winded way of saying the closer you get to allocation decisions, I think the more there should be community involvement and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Great. So maybe just a last uh, a last question to, to summarize things. We spent a lot of time in the V2V partnership thinking about transitions from vulnerability to viability. And, and one of the things that you said, uh, and for really thinking about fisheries sustainability in, in, the, in the fisheries management context, is you have to drive system level change. Um, you're talking about a much more fundamental transformation of the system in order to get the more sustainable outcomes. And I wonder if you can just, uh, in a you know, couple minutes, talk a little bit more about what that means. What, what do you have in mind? Like who who does that involve? To, what is exactly involved in that, that system change? Um, and are there some things that are going to tip us in that direction? Because I suspect there's a lot of things that keep us locked into certain ways of doing things, including the law, as you said. Are there things that can tip us into these more transformative changes that, that you think are, are necessary? I think I'd say a couple of things. One is that the huge contribution or a huge contribution of the VTV partnership and the people around it is to actually talk about these things. And, and I apologize if this sounds sort of flippant and almost dismissive, but conversation, I think, is a, a key starting point to any set of changes. Bureaucrats and governments don't like it when that happens. Bureaucrats often will set things up so that they'll make sure the industry people are over here and the angles are over here and the academics are over here. They keep everybody separate. They design things so there's not a lot of cross-fertilization in there. And so the more interaction and, and conversation and engagement you have, the more ideas percolate and so on. So I think point one would be simply creating the venues and supporting and nurturing the venues for interchange, dialogue, and so on to take place just on the process side of things, driving change, I think is very important, would be point one. Point two is you can't have a dream come true without having a dream. And I think that it's vitally important for people who are interested in driving change to articulate an alternate vision. To sit there and say, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, and so on, and do a whole series of critiques is easy. Sometimes it's kind of fun, uh, and it's very analytical. And one of the things that I see, the greatest respect to my colleagues around the table, occasionally I, I see academic papers that will kind of say, oh my gosh, we've looked at this and studied this, and the following nine things are really bad, and then they stop. Uh, and I've had this conversation with you before, Derek, but it's it's kind of, for me, figuratively, like, you know, you print the paper to read it and you go and you get to the end and you go, oh, I must have accidentally left the last two pages in the photocopier because the part where it says, here's what we should do, is just seems not to be there. Uh, and so I think that the academic community has an enormous contribution to make in articulating alternate visions that are not delusions, they're visions, not the same thing. And so to say, you know, we can create a new model that looks like this based on our understanding, best experience, that kind of stuff and so on, you can inspire people towards something far more effectively than away from something. Most people don't appreciate a smack upside the head and say, now let's talk. That doesn't work. And so driving the change that we're interested in, I think, has to be vision-led. 
And then my final point to wrap up would be that I also just underscore my point, uh, and I'm aware I'm repeating myself, but uh, I don't think system change of substantial nature is going to occur if legal foundations don't change as part of that. And so a key starting point for anyone interested in trying to establish, support, nurture, drive, whatever the term is going to be, uh, what I would describe as more modern and socially just and equitable fisheries management regime, I think a major emphasis has to be on creating a legal foundation that, if nothing else, allows that to happen, which our current regime in Canada does not. But if if it, it ideally goes beyond simply allowing that to happen uh, toward requiring, encouraging, supporting it, if you have a strong legal foundation in place, it's not a guarantee of success. If you have a lousy and problematic legal foundation in, in place, I think it's almost a guarantee of failure. Uh, so to the extent that we can improve the legal foundations, I think you increase the chances of success for what we want to do, which I think is ultimately all about making fisheries and the communities, depending on them, more sustainable and viable for the future. Right. Yeah, great, great observations and great, great suggestions. And I like how you broke it into those three points, which is always very helpful. So much appreciated. Um, okay, well, I, I think we're going to conclude things. Uh, uh, I want to again thank Trevor for your very insightful presentation, uh, some great questions and really wonderful responses. So I think uh, lots of contributions to our dialogue. And, and that's precisely what these are for, is to really create some of these spaces so that we can have those conversations and start to maybe build a bit more of a collective understanding of what a, an alternative might be. So we're not just uh, critiquing, but hopefully working towards some positive solutions. So a great, great piece of advice. So with that, I'm going to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, please uh, stay tuned for, for information on the next webinar, and we look forward to seeing you then. So thanks very much, everybody, and have a great okay. day. Take care. Thanks for having me. I know.